today. My name is Kyle Roberts. I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Thank you for joining us at today's lunchtime lecture with Paul Miles, who's going to be speaking about his new book, The Rise of Thomas Paine and the Case of the Officers of Excise. As I think many of you know, the American Philosophical Society is the oldest learned society in the United States. It was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. It continues its mission of promoting useful knowledge through research, fellowships, and public outreach. And as we've learned this spring, useful knowledge can be promoted virtually. So we are very excited to be doing these programs with you. This program is also sponsored by the David Center for the American Revolution, which may well be the nation's newest research center for the study of the American Revolution. The David Center is a collaboration between the David Library of the American Revolution and the American Philosophical Society. It's dedicated to supporting scholarship on the American Revolution. The David Library's founder, Saul Finestone, believed that examination of founding fathers' values and the events of the revolutionary period was essential to creating an informed citizenry able to comprehend and adapt those founding principles to the ever-evolving circumstances of American society. And I think, again, ever-evolving is probably pretty key to what we're all going through right now. I very much encourage you to visit the David Center homepage on the American Philosophical Society website, and we will be putting that uh, into our chat. Um, and go to that webpage, and you'll see the latest updates on our collaboration. Uh, and this program is one, one example of that kind of, uh, of, that, of our work. Please also check the APS website regularly as we add new virtual programs for your edification and enjoyment. A few really quick Zoom uh, etiquette notes uh, before we start. We are all in Zoom webinar mode, and uh, so you will all be muted. All of you attendees are muted during this talk. Uh, so don't worry, you know, if your cat runs across your lap, you will not accidentally make a noise that, uh, that brings the camera to you. We're going to be using the question and answer function uh, for the Q&A portion. So uh, our speaker today is going to speak for about 30 or 40 minutes. We're hoping to have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. If you look at the very bottom of your nav bar uh, in the center, you will see a Q&A button. Click on that and you can ask questions, uh, which we will then uh, hope to get through most of them today. Um, we are also recording this talk and it will be made available on the APS website. Uh, so if you have some friends who didn't get to see it, uh, or if you want to share it with the kid, you know, students in your class, we encourage you to do so. So please let me introduce uh, Dr. David Gary, Associate Director of Collections at the APS, who is going to introduce uh, Paul Miles. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle, and welcome to everyone. So today we're going to hear about uh, the Ameri one of the American Philosophical Society's favorite figures, Thomas Paine. Uh, the APS has one of the greatest collections of printed materials by and about Thomas Paine in the world. It's around 4,500 volumes that were left to us at the death of Colonel Richard Gimbel in 1971. Uh, Gimbel bequeathed some amazing books, including Edmund Burke's own copy of The Rights of Man, uh, but he could not find a first edition copy of the pamphlet that's at the focus of our talk today, The Case of the Officers of Excise. This is Paine's first political pamphlet published in 1772, um, and I should note that the APS eventually did purchase a first edition copy in the late 1970s. Uh, to tell the story of this pamphlet, we have independent scholar Paul Miles, who lives in Lewis in the United Kingdom, where Paine also lived from 1768 to 1774. So it's easy to imagine the 18th century members of the APS nodding in approval at Paul's mastery of several fields during his career. He was an engineer who managed large construction projects for 25 years. He then sold his business and went back to school to earn a master's degree in psychology. Um, specializing in substance misuse, he currently teaches at the Brighton and Sussex Medical School. In 2009, he moved into history when he oversaw a major festival in Lewis to mark the 200th anniversary of Paine's death, leading to the publication of two books, Thomas Paine and Lewis, 1768 to 1774, a prelude to, the American, a prelude to American Independence, released in 2009 with a new edition hot off the presses this year, um, and The Rise of Thomas Paine and the, case of the of, and, the, and the Case of the Officers of Excise, published in 2018. He's also a board member and officer of the Thomas Paine Society UK. Welcome, Paul. Hi, thank you for that introduction, and uh, I'll carry on with the with the talk. Thank you. So this is um, I like I very much like this. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for thanks for attending today. It's great to be able to talk to 
America like this from um, my, my hometown of Lewis. Um, there's a bit of a story behind this which uh, should explain some of the context. So it started with the, in preparation for the festival that we had uh, that we held in 2009 here celebrating this. I'd recently before uh, been involved with mounting some large uh, art exhibitions, sculpture exhibitions, Rodin's, The Kiss, Henry Moore's, Anthony Caro, David Nash. So the town was, and I was used to, if you like, organising large events. So this came up and I said, would I, you know, would I have a look at this? And I was, um, having just finished degrees in psychology, um, I was interested in intellectual process actually, so this seemed, this seemed like a good idea. Um, so we set to. Uh, we, uh, we started looking, at, we very quickly realised that there wasn't actually much known about Payne's time uh, in Lewis, or in certainly uh, about Payne's time in England before he left for America for the first time in 1774. So uh, although there was quite, there's perennially uh, two or three biographies every year come out on pain, they tend to gloss over this first period and there's not, there's not very little detail there. And what is there when you really looked into it, didn't stand up to close scrutiny. And so I was joined uh, during the research period. We, we researched this for a couple of years before the festival uh, by um, Dr. Colin Brent, who's the most eminent historian, Lewis historian, who had looked in a bit into this um, and, and written a couple of articles. And, uh, and um, Dr. Seth Gobin, an art historian from New York, who, who was in charge of Rutgers Abroad Study Program, who happened to be living in Lewis at that time, um, we bumped into each other uh, through the council's network and uh, he's been a great help uh, during that formative phase and ever since actually and I know you're out there Seth Pai. So, um, so that was uh, what we start, we employed a picture researcher first which is Tim Wilcox who, who used to be curator of Dulwich Gallery, a very good gallery in London and so he's at the top of his game and he came up with this image uh, and so I want to talk about the images first, which lead into this research, or give us a, try and get our eye on the man and the place. So this one's never been used before. This is a photograph of a painting. We don't know where the painting is. It's a photograph that lies in Thomas Paine's box in the Heinz archive uh, of the National Portrait Gallery. And you can't, probably can't quite see it on this screen, but it says Thomas Paine there, London, 1790. It's quite common for these portraits like this not to be signed. There is no signature, but the painting does exist out there somewhere. And I really like this painting. It looks like a man, whereas the original, the sharp engraving of Romney looks good. And there are some others out there, I quite like the APS one actually, but um, this, this really does look like a man. And just a quick little story on this, while, while we're having the uh, festival in Lewis, uh, we were on the newspaper, we were, we were out on the BBC, we had something like 2,000 events over 10 days. It was a big affair, a lot of fun. And um, someone got in touch with me and said, I think I'm a descendant of Thomas Paine. Well, we pretty much knew that couldn't be, but I agreed to meet this person who came up on Saturday afternoon to the house. And when they came up the steps, um, I, it sent a chill right through me because there was a very strong lightning to the, exactly this portrait. And it turned out this person was descended from Thomas Paine's father's brother, so Paine's uncle, uh, down the same line. So anyway, I, I really like this image. So that's just to look at the man. Um, so the next slide is Lewis. This is Lewis. Um, uh, Lewis in 1760 painted by, uh, Tim came up with this, this is a big painting, this is two metres wide and uh, nearly a metre high, a wonderful detailed view of Lewis from the south which is much the same as it is now, this was painted in 1760, eight years before Payne arrived in town, it's, uh, so here we have Pelham House bathed in sunlight this was the house of the Duke of Newcastle, the kind of prime minister at the time. The painting was commissioned by Henry Shelley, 
who was kind of an agent for, per, for the Duke of Newcastle. And uh, Shelley uh, had a house, it's up here somewhere at Shelley's Hotel. Now it is the Shelley uh, Poet family as well, all related. Um, here's the Spire of St. Michael's where Thomas Scott Payne got married to Elizabeth. The castle was there. All this skyline looks about the same now as it did then. Any Americans visiting Lewis, it's like walking through a diorama of uh, where one of your founding fathers walked through in a way that I don't believe exists uh, perhaps for the others. So even more interestingly, this uh, Sarah's came and painted again, uh, again for Shelley in 1768. And this painting is in the ownership of the Gage family nearby. And I will talk about the gauge a little bit more on the next slide, but that's just an important part of this whole story. So here we have, we have Lewis in 1768, exactly the year that Thomas Paine rode into town. And again, it's, um, you know, Lewis is much the same. There are some political differences. The, the uh, Henry Shelley apparently fell out of favour with Pelham uh, and the Duke of Newcastle was died in this year in this year so Pelham House isn't bathed in sunlight anymore but we have a very nice view uh, the the mound here yeah, still exists this is south over church uh, all, all these buildings are there the churches uh, and the, you, you can see the bases of the windmill sites and that one disappeared from eight years before so uh, what came out of that one that was mentioned earlier by David is, is the book, um, Thomas Paine and Lewis, which has just been the second edition we've just got out. And I'll just um, hang on that a, a moment because what's, uh, the, uh, we've been able to put more in this book uh, from when we wrote, wrote it in 2009. It's a collection of essays by Colin Brent, Dave, Deborah Gage and myself with an introduction by Dr. Seth Gopin and essays by Susan Morris on those landscapes. But also in this book, we've got extra essays about um, General Thomas Gage, who was uh, commander in chief of the British forces for 11 years leading up to the War of Independence. And he, and he remained there to hear the first shot that was heard around the world. Um, uh, according to Deborah Gage, uh, uh, well, his descendant, he was a very good administrator, um, perhaps not such a good general, but he, he was instrumental in preparing America in, in a sense with the ability to, to go for independence. He improved the ports, he parlayed with the Indians, in, improved roads. So there's a good history there and fascinating. What's really come to the fore of my mind this time with uh, there's extra essays in here about his document box and the first military map of New York, the Montresor map, which I show in this second edition, um, is that um, Sir Thomas uh, General Gage was made a member of the American Philosophical Society in 1768, as was Payne later, and I'm gonna look a bit more, you would know that this society much more about this than, than I do, but it's fascinating that both men were members of the American Philosophical Society. Um, both men were highly instrumental on either side of the, the momentous occasion of the War of Independence, and both men had very strong links to Lewis. Payne living here for the six formative years before he uh, departed to come to the North American colonies, and um, so, uh, General Thomas Gage, the, his family seat, the ancestral home where they've been for 700 years, is a fell place just five miles outside Lewis. It's extraordinary. So there we are. We'll leave this and get straight to the uh, the case of the officers of excise, which is the purpose of today's talk. And um, uh, it's marvellous that you have a copy there of the American Philosophical Society. I have, I've only ever seen one held in my hands at the British Li at the British Library, where it's bound in with a lot of other pamphlets, which they wouldn't at that time allow me to take apart to get to get a real good look at it. But. Um, uh, here it is. Um, let me just get my thing up there. So, just before we get to that, the um, the first biography of Payne, and I mentioned biographies earlier on, and the way that they tend to churn the same information without going into detail of what we found in Lewis. 
Uh, George Chalmers was employed by the British government to defame Paine uh, around about the 1790s after he'd written Rights of Man. And that book, uh, Chalmers, he wrote under the pseudonym of Francis Aldous, but, but he was paid to defame Paine and, he, and he, did, he didn't miss a trick, he did it uh, at every turn. Uh, and he was an assiduous researcher. Most 99% of his facts are correct when you, when you go back over it. He did his job properly. He was a, a skilled writer and researcher himself and ended up on the board, of, uh, secretary to the Board of Trade, a very important post for England. Now, uh, because he was paid to defend him, it's very rare that he actually says anything positive about pain. But he does praise, he mentions it in this first book called The Life of Pain. Uh, he praises the case of the officers of excise, mentions it's an octavo pamphlet of 21 pages, and he grudgingly noted it was well written. So the case, just getting to the case now, is a detailed account of a very large organisation beset by corruption from, a, from within and above. And what, what I look for when I was, so this, took, this is the result of 10 years of intermittent research, by the way, this, it was a, it was a research question left over from that first book and that first re research period, that is still, there were certain things missing, certain things didn't add up. So we kept digging and digging. And what I ended up with, what you take away from this at the end of it, is that it's, it's Payne's empathy and it gets to the core values of human decency. And, and the whole case is a reductive philosophical exercise. It cleaves to the heart of decency and exposes the dark side of human behavior and how this can affect, affect people's lives, the well-being of their individual lives, the well-being of the nation as well. Uh, we must remember, while Payne was in Lewis, he wasn't radical. He was working, he was a civil servant, and the case is actually an effort to make life better for England, not worse. He's, he was instructed from above to write this, this case. So this is the front page uh, of uh, printed, the case of the officers of exercise, some 3,000 copies of these 21 page pamphlet were printed in Lewis by William Lee, the same man who owned the Lewis newspaper. And I like this copy and I like it because of this blot actually, and I like the patterning and the whole style of the thing. So that's the front of the pamphlet there. Inside pages, we won't go into the whole detail of it. It's a long document. Uh, I do analyze it in the book that, that's published. Uh, I believe it's the first time it's been actually analyzed, uh, this, this pamphlet. So here we are. Uh, it's a case. It's setting out an argument. Um, and it takes quite a long time, or it took me a long time, to really get my head around what, what was going on here. You know, how, what is a case anyway? And, and, uh, and what is a petition? You know, what's the difference? And how does a, this all come together? So this is just to show you an inside page of the case. And uh, here we are, the introduction. And his, his prose, he, you can see Payne's style emerging here and uh, it flows, it's to the point, it, it's concise, it's almost, it's, read, it's written to be read out. Uh, it's understandable by everyone who reads it. It's an easy read and it cuts to the chase very well indeed. You can see that this is where, where all his great writing comes from. This is, he, he, he had it here um, and we can, I'll talk a bit later about well, how did that happen? How did he get to be such a good writer? And I think we have some answers to that as we go through. So the first clue, we started digging. This is, uh, there were certain things we knew before the, the deeper research. And uh, this is a letter to Dr. Goldsmith, the great Oliver Goldsmith, who writes uh, that She Stoops to Conquer. This, this, this is a giant in the literary world. He's a personal friend of, uh, of Samuel Johnson. He attended the Turks, the Turks head in, in the club, the, the literary club that Johnson had arranged with Boswell and Garrick and other great names of the day. Uh, Goldsmith was there. So Payne wrote a letter to Goldsmith. Uh, um, contrary to popular belief and contrary to many inserts in many biographies, Goldsmith, they never got together. Goldsmith 
Goldsmith never answered this. Goldsmith died not long after this, so that there wasn't no relationship developed from this, but the clues were in the writing and they've kind of been missed before. So this is just to show you the, the page, the writing, and here it's very nice to see Thomas Paine's uh, signature there. Um, and, he, and he says he'll take the liberty of waiting on you in a day or two, but he never did. Um, and it's these are the clues that I want to start digging into now. Um, and it says here uh, that he's the principal promoter of a plan for applying to Parliament this session for an increase of salary. A petition for the, and these are important, this is really important, a petition for this purpose has been circulated through every part of the kingdom and signed by all the officers therein. All the officers, every part of the kingdom. This is huge. And this doesn't say case, by the way, this says petition, okay? So there's, there's two things going on here. And here we are uh, in many, many of the biographies, um, including uh, starting with, with um, Chalmers, uh, it's, it's said that Payne was just a troublemaker, he's a rabble raiser, he got, he got some of his mates together in the exercise and there he is causing trouble again. And he's, and he's the one who got this all together. But as a, a previous researcher, a member of the Thomas Paine Society, uh, George Heinmarch pointed out, that just wouldn't be possible then. Uh, it wouldn't actually be possible now to, to get the, uh, your act together for such a big uh, uh, nationwide. Uh, don't, uh, Paine was, was just one step up from supernumerary, which is the, the bottom rung of the exercise world. And he was a, an, a, 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 an outrider. He was a, a proper officer. It was very hard to get there, but he wasn't. He wasn't a national figure. He didn't come from any class or status, and he certainly wasn't wealthy. So this is an extraordinary mismatch. And he says it here. And I should. And this is in the letter to Goldsmith. Uh, Such as it is, it is my first and only attempt of writing. And even now, should I? I should have not uh, undertaken had it not had I not been particularly applied to by some of my superiors in office. So Payne says it. He doesn't start this. His superiors in office start this. Extraordinary. Um, these. Uh, so here we are. We we had some of this. Uh, High March had written this up in a previous book, but he hadn't he hadn't referenced anything. We had to go searching for these documents again. And we found all these documents, by the way, in the uh, loosely laid in boxes in the National Archives in Kew. So not catalogued. That they, that although they've got folio numbers, there's no list of what's in these boxes. You just really have to keep looking at and encounter them. And this is an application to the commissioners of excise. There's, there's nine commissioners of excise. So they sit in London and look at the bidding books every week and make decisions about the, how this national service is running, all under the employ of the Crown, the money all going to the Crown, um, to the civil service, uh, via the Treasury. So there's a, um, here we have, uh, I won't go through it in detail, but it's the petition from eight ordinary officers of excise, and here's Thomas Payne down here, applying, uh, saying that there's a, here's a petition here, it says. Okay, so that's to the, that's to the commissioners of excise, um, not to the treasury. This is to the treasury from the committee, uh, the commissioners of excise. And here we have our man, George Lewis Scott. This, this is the man that, that jumps out all the time. He's, he's the man that picks, Thomas Paine out of obscurity and thrusts him on the national stage and eventually the world stage is all about George Lewis Scott. George Lewis Scott, Commissioner of Excise, previously tutor, preceptor to King George III in his minority. So he knew King George III very well indeed and he was in a position of great power and influence. This is a letter from the, all the commissioners to the Treasury, putting forward this argument for, for higher pay. 
Uh, and here we are, that goes forward in 1773. Um, and it says a petition here, and the case, and the case went to, as it said before, both houses of parliament, to every officer in the country, and also to important businessmen. So the case supports the petition, as it were. This was the answer very quickly. It was received uh, by the Treasury on February the 5th, 1773. And, on, and just uh, a few days later, um, it's been read. And here's the answer here, nil. It was rejected. And I cover that in the book, why that was rejected. There's some good detail there, but they weren't having any of it. They, they give the officers of excise money, they got to give everybody money. The officers of excise had had their pay frozen for a hundred years. They were really struggling with uh, inflation in, in the country. Uh, and this is what Payne lays out in the case. So here we are, just, just to come back to this, uh, just to, to refresh ourselves. A petition for this purpose has been circulated through every part of the kingdom and signed by all the officers wherein. Well, these signatures were missing. We couldn't find any of them uh, for, for years, for six or seven years. We were trying, trying, trying. And I was, I'd been taken on by uh, Professor Watmore at the University of Sussex to look further into this. I, followed him up to the University of St Andrews afterwards and carried on working. And I used to take students up with me because I became um, reasonably competent at looking for documents. And I was there with, uh, with one student uh, one day, deep in the bowels of the National Archives in Kew, and there they were. We found some signatures. What a moment that was. Just lying there in the box. And we found two documents. Uh, this is a petition, by the way. So not the case, this is the petition. But if you, if you obviously don't have the time now, but this, this, this is a very concise version of the case, actually, this writing at the top of it, the petition. It was just wonderful to find these signatures, I can't tell you. And there were two documents. There it is laid out. And this was the uh, for Wales and Hertfordshire, and one was for Hertfordshire. So these went round to the collecting officers and were signed by all the officers therein. And it says which outright they come from and so on and so forth. So there we are, we found it. Uh, and there's just a, another detail there. So this became a forensic, so what was going on here? This became, you know, who, who instructed this? How could we tell, you know, who was, who was organizing all this? And, and over the years, and by thinking about it and forgetting about it and going back to it, and many, many discussions, uh, it became a detective job, um, a forensic examination, uh, employing all the kind of skills that you can apply to this. You know, what was it like to be in a workplace? What was it like to live then? How could this even happen? You know, what was George Lewis Scott up to? And it turns out uh, George Lewis Scott was a great mathematician. He, was, he sat on the board of Longitude, awarding the, um, the, the reward to, uh, to the chap who, who developed the, the, the first reliable sea clock, um, which name escapes me right at the moment, but, but, but he was a known mathematician, and we can track letters, we look very closely at George Lewis Scott, he was, he was on the, um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, the Society of Antiquaries, you name it, he was on it. Uh, he'd been on societies earlier on promoting authors, finding a way of getting authors paid way back some, some 25 years before this. He was a real thinker and we, we're, we're sure that he was brought into the, as a commissioner, to, to solve the problem of corruption within the service and this is how he did it. And this is one of the main clues here that uh, so it could have been done from outlying districts. Uh, it had to be done from inside because here we have one of what must have been 20 or 30 documents like this going around the country collecting these signatures. This one was obviously bent for Scotland. That was crossed out and Wales put underneath there. So that, that couldn't have been written in the place that it was meant for. They wouldn't have got that wrong. So this was a big clue for this that was definitely done from central office. 
So that was the signatures, and uh, we talk about more than about that in the book. But the other clue, the other clues came from the minute books of the excise, which are a wonderful thing to read. Uh, it's the way that this big organisation is run. The, the books are filled in in all the collecting offices in the towns that they're a centre for the excise collections, and Lewis was a centre, and there was an office in the in the White Hart. Um, and so the, these forward book, these minute books would be sent up with very tight character references of people and goings-ons and misdemeanors and uh, you know all the business of being an excise officer. Very clever people, these officers. They had to be numerate, they had to gauge, they had to assess uh, gravity of beer uh, in, in unusual shape. Um, Types of vehicles, so they're, they're very uh, clever people, um, and they were suffering as well. So the the, the short terse comments in these, but but at this time, and this is part of this story, this is a very important part of this story. Payne had been discharged from the from the office before in Affel for what's known as stamping. And it turns out it looks more like he was whistleblown because if someone got, if someone reported uh, from someone up above them, the convention was that the lowest person in the in that service in that collection got the sack. And so um, Payne lays this out in the case. So uh, here we are, for the first time ever, there's a 20-page entry from Cornwall with a mass exposure of corruption. So the whistleblowing started from Cornwall on, in the year that Payne arrived in Lewis. So this, the timing of this is critical. So for the first time ever, and this is what these minutes look like, for the first time ever, people could report this, did report their superiors in Cornwall, there are 20 pages of these reports in that minute book. And at the end, and I lay out in the book, uh, um, for the first time ever, the collector was sacked and uh, supervisors moved around the country and, and, and admonished. And this had never happened before. It was usually the first man, the last man in or the youngest one in the service, they just got booted out and they carried on the corruption as before. So this was a real moment and the timing is perfect because that's, this is the time that petition's going round and Payne is plucked out of obscurity. How is he plucked out of obscurity? We, we think we know, I'm gonna say it in a minute. But he's plucked out of obscurity to support this petition that's going round the country, which he could not have been organizing. This had to be Scott, uh, Scott, later introducing Thomas Paine to Benjamin Franklin and, and Paine coming to America with a, a golden letter of introduction from the great Benjamin Franklin. So how do we, how do we, uh, how do we explain this, this, this Paine being picked out of nowhere? Well, we talked about the newspaper a little bit earlier on and uh, this was the first ever Sussex newspaper established by William Lee in 17... 1746. William Lee uh, also printed the 3,000 copies of the case of the Officers of Exiles. And we've established beyond any reasonable doubt that, that Thomas Paine contributed to this newspaper as well, writing letters, and again I lay out in the book, he write, write hum, letters of humanity. He uh, writes a letter about the iniquities of the Elizabethan Poor Law that was uh, in, in force at the time. Payne sat on the vestry of St Michael's overseeing the Poor Law. And the Poor Law meant at that time that where, if you were elsewhere in the country and you needed help, you had to return to your mother parish to get aid. They wouldn't look after you where you were. This was changed later. Um, in about 1820 to the Union Pool or where you got where you got relief at the point that you needed it. But in, in this time, Payne observed someone arriving at the bottom of Keir Street in Lewis, uh, infested with lice, nearly naked, laying in, in the back of a car in straw, and he died not long after he arrived. And he wrote a letter to, to, that was published in the Sussex Weekly Appetizer saying, how, how could we live like this? We've got to do better. So again, Payne showing his humanity, 
living in this busy, lively, vibrant market town of Lewis, and he's a player here. He knows people. He moved in with Samuel Olive, who was a senior high constable in into Bull House, and he's fraternising. He's playing bowls at the bowling green. He's fraternising with Lee. He's, he sits on the court lead, which is the, the governance of Lewis at that time. It's not a mayor, a court. It's not a mayor and a corporation. It's not a society of 12. It got reverted to a court lead, which is a Norman device, a much more open grained uh, way of governing a small town. Uh, and it was reverted to that by King Charles II because Lewis was a regicide town, actually signed, was one of the signatures on the death warrant of Charles I. As a Charles II reached into those towns and changed them, he, 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 um, he altered the way that it was governed. And it just so happens that in a court lead, you don't need to be a freeman to do business in the town. And a society of 12 is, is uh, normally picked with family members. It rotates around a very tight group. But a court lead is much more open. And Payne sat on the court lead. He sat on the court lead and he sat on the vestry. And he says later in The Rights of Man that, that, that English towns run like a republic because there's no hand of the crown in it. And uh, I, you know, we, we, there's a lot more fun to be had with this newspaper. Um, I've been working on, um, I got them digitized uh, some, I'm still working on this some uh, five years ago. Uh, they can't be word scanned. Um, um, so I'm having to go through each article one by one and I'm classifying them and it bursts into life, this newspaper. And uh, it shows you what, what, what Lewis was like. It showed you uh, the paper itself has got so much good writing in it. Um, uh, the letters are lively. Uh, the, the, the Lee recomposites the newspaper weekly from daily reports from London. All the newspapers come down here and he inches the story through day by day with lots of different tapes from the different newspapers in London and some longer articles as well, beautifully written. And you can see that Payne would, would have been, as it turns out, in his element here with words all about him, views, opinion. And what drew my interest to this is, is that, that Lee republished one of the letters of Junius who openly attacked the king and his ministry. We still to this day don't know who Junius is, but Lee would have been risking his neck to publish that letter. They were first published in the public art uh, advertiser. So this is work yet to, still to go on. This is further research, uh, which will lead on from this. So this is just to show you the work that's going on at the moment in this newspaper. It's yet to give up a lot more clues. So um, there we are. I'm, I'm kind of coming to the end of this now, this, this talk. It's, it's, so this turned out to be a news story about Thomas Paine. Uh, so breaking news from the 18th century, if you like. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I figured that, that it would be very, that Payne's daily sucker come from his job and his fellow people, and it would have been very important to him his job in, in the exercise service. So, uh, for the first time in this book, we've got his progress from from the minute book entries, every move that Payne makes officially, and we reproduce them as well in this book uh, uh, to, to show that in one in one place. Secondly, we show the long, slow national campaign to, 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 up, to outroot corruption within the excise service. So a massive job here. And Payne was trying to make things better for his fellow workers and for the king and for the whole country. The failure of this, the inability of, of the British government to, to acknowledge this, um, resulted in Payne coming to America. And we know what happened then. So um, also at this time, uh, you're probably well aware of it over there, but I didn't know this bit, that Benjamin Franklin was, was in London at this time and openly attacking the, the, the bungling ministry uh, that is so well attacked in the local news, the Lewis newspaper as well. But he openly attacks him in the public advertiser. I always thought he was keeping quiet, but he wasn't. He was speaking out at this time. In this book, we analyse the case for the first time, and then I've mentioned the newspaper before. 
So there we are. This is the book um, that is um, uh, shamelessly on sale now uh, on Amazon. It's a down. It's a, a low cost download, or you can buy it print on demand. It's, uh, I'm happy with the quality by Ingram Scott. It's available in every bookshop. Uh, uh, in, in America, or all over the world actually, and, and, and as a download. Um, it took a while to write. I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased that Richard Watmore gave me um, the, the title, The Rise of Thomas Paine. He reckoned I, I had explained that with this, with this research. And of course, Melvin Bragg, you may not know in America, but he's a Lord Bragg actually, um, has been, um, he's, he's the ch uh, president of a Thomas Paine Society and uh, he's been, uh, he does a weekly Radio 4 programme on intellectual history and all things uh, intellectual. He's been doing it for, gosh, 30, 40 years now. So I'm very uh, pleased that he thought this book was okay as well. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you for your kind attention and uh, I'll hand back to the, uh, the administrators now. Thank you. That was fantastic, Paul. Thank you uh, so much for that really sort of rich talk. We already have uh, looks like four questions queued up for you, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna keep you going a little bit longer. Um, a reminder to everybody out there who is uh, watching: please use the uh, Q and A uh, box, which you will find right at the center uh, of the bottom navigation bar. Uh, go ahead and type your, your questions in there so that we can all see them. Uh, first question goes uh, actually to uh, my colleague, Dave Gary. So Dave, if you want to unmute yourself and come back in. Here I am. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Thank you. Uh, a, a quick question. Can you give a little more background on the excise officers? You know, these are, these are tax collectors and on the surface, it seems unlikely that, um, you know, we should have sympathy for them. So why were things so bad for them? Can you describe that to us? Yes. Um, they, they were bad for them uh, because by, on the statute book, um, their pay had been frozen for a very long time, for 100 years, as I mentioned before. There was real tension. Uh, there are several strands to this, actually. Um, but firstly, to get to the case, it was one of the very few jobs that you could get that paid a regular wage. So they were desirable. It was a, it was a, uh, I would imagine there was a quite a bit of status. And not only, um, was it a regular income? It embedded you into deeply into all the farmers, the brewers, the business people. And what pain lies, out, lies open here is that everybody was on the take. So although they were struggling for, for wages, they were all on the take as well. So it was a way in to, if you like, um, enhance their income. But they, they had to go through a lot, and I explain that in the book, they had to go through a lot of, uh, they had to be recommended by someone high up, uh, it was class written, uh, they had to, to take very strict examinations, they had to be of moral fibre, they had to take oaths, these oaths would have meant something, I lay the oaths out actually. And so the exercise were embedded all over the country, uh, they brought business into town, and I've just written an article, actually, I'll send it to you if you like, about Thomas Tipper, who was a brewer in New Haven, near here, at the same time as Payne, and everybody loved Tipper. Uh, Cleo Rickman, who, who inherited half of Payne's wealth when he died. He left half of it to Cleo Rickman. He was born, he was six years old when he came into town, but he lived with Rickman in London when he wrote Rise of Man. Rickman wrote an epitaph on Thomas Tipper, the excise man's stone. I'll send you it, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good bit of verse. But you could see that Tipper was very popular, so they weren't hated. Um, and they were allowed to run businesses themselves at the same time as being an excise officer. So nothing's clear, but what was clear is that they generally they were struggling. They were really, they were paid about the same as a labourer, but they had to be and they could be moved about the country and so they didn't have their family to help them and they'd be away from their wife and children as well they had to send money back pay for their own lodges pay for their own horse collect money and struggle at the same time Great. i hope that answers a bit anyway there's a lot there's a lot more obviously but yeah so uh paul we have a question here from steve gullick who asks as an actor he's an, an impersonator uh, he's interested in what you might know about what Thomas Paine might have sounded like 
any sense of what his uh, accent might have been? Well, that's <laughs> very hard to get your eye on Thomas Paine, the man. I've, I've almost given up. Uh, he, he, he's not really liked, actually, by many people. Um, what did he sound like? He must have been a good speaker. He, he debated at the White Hart Evening Club, and he won, he was awarded the obstinate, the headstrong book of obstinacy for the most persistent haranguer. So he could articulate. Um, there's another bit where I transcribed the letter from a spy who was who is spied Payne leaving London to go to France for the first time when he sailed to Calais. And um, this this spy doesn't have any axe to grind, he just reports what happens that day. And uh, he said that Payne looked unkempt, unshaven, he looked like a drunken tailor who'd been playing bowls for three days without sleeping. It's hard. <laughs> Ruskin does a good job of it in America, I think. Ian Ruskin. And actually, the next question I have is from Ian Ruskin, uh, oh. who, Life of Thomas Paine Productions. Um, first, he says that your talk has inspired him or is inspiring him to organize another England tour, which I think sounds quite wonderful. Um, he'd like to know to what extent you think that Paine's Quaker upbringing on his father's side influenced his fight for human decency and humanity. Absolutely core to this. I think the Quaker values are core to every fiber in Paine's bones, body. Uh, that's what that's what sings out right the way through. Um, interesting childhood because uh, his father married a, an Anglican and was ejected from from the Quakers. Uh, but Payne uh, actually asked to be buried in in a, in a Quaker in a Quaker graveyard at the end, and he was refused entry into that. But I think if you if you look at the Quaker if you look at the Quaker uh, basic philosophies, they're all there. They're all there for Payne. It, it, it sounds, I think it's very, very important. The next question we have is from David Maxey, who asks, how, how particularized was the case made against corruption? Um, uh, sorry, uh, actually, is that an American term, particularized? Could, could you expand on that question, please? I don't. Um, I think maybe sort of getting at, it sounds like this is a very sort of exhaustive work. Is he making the argument, um, if we think about uh, common sense, right, where he, we see Payne sort of working at the level of sort of humanity, right, thinking about these, you know, the sort of homespun wisdom, right, to try to make the argument. Is early Payne um, a sort of fax man? Is he digging right down and making, you know, very specific or is he going maybe for a loftier sort of rhetoric? No, 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 I get it now. Yeah, well, <laughs> if you've ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, Payne does much the same job. He cleaves down and deep and down and deep and he does, yeah, he does particularize, absolutely. And that's what he does. Uh, and and he, he develops a style that you can see later uh, right through all his work. So he does on this, on the one hand this, and on the other hand that. And he uses one thing to contrast another, and then he dig a bit deeper, and then he does it again, and he digs a bit deeper, and he does it again. It's a philosophical work. I mean, this is perfect for, for the society in a sense. But he does, yeah, he digs right in, absolutely. Uh, the detail is astonishing, and that's that's what I work at. And he compares it to people he knows, actual instances of suffering, people that he helps out with with loans and uh, so on and so forth. So yes, absolutely. Great, yes. thank you. Um, we have a question from Adriana Link, wondering if you could talk a little bit about your work as a public historian, right, working within the community and what it means to sort of connect Thomas Paine with the broader public through exhibitions, festivals, and other events. Uh, yes, this ebbs and flows. I mean, it was great when we did the festival, and then uh, Lewis is a busy, still a busy town with bonfire and lots of traditions. So um, uh, it's a bit harder here with Thomas Paine. He's not well known. And, and those that do don't particularly like him because he's portrayed as a traitor and it's hard to get over that. Um, but 
there are moments, and there just has been one actually, uh, that's one of the reasons why this is happening right now, is I was approached by the railway station, Lewis railway station, it's a big railway station, and they have an out outreach program uh, going on, and they wanted to do something on famous people that lived here, and they, they said, you know a thing about Thomas Paine, do you want to do this? I said, yeah, sure I do. So they've given me, it hasn't happened because of the COVID, but, but I've done the work. I've produced uh, 15 posters, and the story, and they're going to be in all the waiting rooms in Lewis Railway Station. It's a mainline railway station that goes up to London. It's a very busy commuter with five waiting rooms, I think, and I'm going to get some big posters. So actually, it's starting to happen this. I thought it was all over, but here we are. It's great. <laughs> and that Lewis, remind me, also has a, has a sculpture of pain. Is that correct? Yes, it does. Yes, uh, it was carved by Marcus... Um, Cornish, uh, who, who, who has done a lot of sculptures for the Royal Family actually, but I do know him personally and he's made a really good one. I'll send you a photo of it over, it's down by Lewis Library. It's a very nice carving, yeah, we got ours at last, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have, uh, I'm going to, uh, Manu Radishkashanan, I'm sorry, I'm probably mangling your last name, Manu. Uh, asked, was there opposition to the petition? Um, you know, you sort of gave us the high level opposition. Maybe it was their sort of popular opposition. I can imagine that raising salaries would not be popular in the government and fighting corruption would be not popular among his fellow excise officers. Yeah, um, opposition. The fact, well, that does raise some good questions, actually. And I, and I look at that closely because this, this it must have been instructed from the top because if the convention had been then for the supervisors in every collecting town so a collection did an area like a collection was Cornwall and then you'd have supervisors in collecting towns like Lewis so you might have 15 collections uh, 15 offices in Cornwall and in every one of those offices the convention had been uh, that if if anyone reported any corruption the lowest one got the sack so these supervisors have been protecting themselves. Swallow was the was the was the supervisor in Afford when Payne got the sack the first time. Swallow got the sack about six months later for using Payne's orderly books. So there must have been resistance from the supervisors. There must have been resistance from anyone who wasn't a lowly officer, but they must have had to have done what they were told by the commissioners. You're right. You spotted that. Yeah, I've, 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 I've thought about that quite a lot, and that, that this was something that had to be done. Yeah, I think there was opposition. I think there would have been. <laughs> I was really struck, and I really enjoyed your conversation about the newspaper uh, in Luz. I think the, I love the work you're doing there, digging in, thinking about going on that granular level into what people are reading. Um, and it just really made me sort of wonder, if, you're th if we're thinking about Payne, 1772, uh, in Lewis, two years later, makes his way to Philadelphia, is in many ways, is your thinking that Philadelphia might be a lot more like Lewis, Lewis than London? Uh, you know, is there, do you think there's sort of a provincial bond um, that the Atlantic um, doesn't sort of separate them, but in fact, the condition of living in both of those places is, as part of this larger empire is more alike than different? Yes, I, th I think. <laughs> uh, yes, I think that's possible. One one of the clues it was uh, there was a question asked earlier, and I meant to, I meant to address that is that the um, the American accent on the East Coast there, I think may have been the accent here. Then um, you you say words uh, regular regular verbs that we we don't use anymore, but you present like gotten and uh, this was common in, in the 18th century England at that time. And I, and I wonder if, if, our, um, if our air received pronunciation is more a Germanic uh, kind of house of Mountbatten and Windsor um, strain. Uh, and, I, and I wonder if, if the East Coast of America isn't, isn't our accent, actually. I do wonder that. Uh, certainly some of your, the way that you structure language is being preserved in a way that we, that's moved, that, that's morphed differently here. As for, as for community, gosh, I don't know, Henry, I'd have to come back. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, 
Uh, David, so we're still on the accent question. David Ward asks, would Payne not have had a Norfolk style of accent uh, being born and grown up there? Well, yes, he certainly would have done. Yes, that's for sure. I know David, he's a fellow committee of the Thomas Paine Society. Hello. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, good point, David. Yes, I shouldn't leave you out, should I, up there? Um, yeah, I don't know what the brogue uh, was up there. Sussex, the Sussex accent, uh, which you don't hear very much these days, some of my family had it, and I, I can slip into it. Um, is not so far off the Norfolk brogue or the West Country brogue. You get these elongated vowel sounds and uh, particular twists. So, yeah, what, what a mix. I should imagine it's emerging of all. People tend to change their accents. They tend to move them towards the people they like. Mm -hmm. uh, in psychology, you tend to move towards the diction and, and phraseology of people you like and away from the people you don't. So, you know, to get on, we, we, we emulate each other all the time, but who knows, yeah, it's a mix. Let me ask uh, one final question and then we'll let you, you go for the day. Um, 10 years, right? You spent a long time working on this work. What advice do you have uh, for fellow historians who are working on these sort of elusive questions you know, we have a lot of uh, doctoral students who are part of our community right now who are sort of wrestling with thinking they had access to archives and now they're sort of working at home. Um, you know, they're worried about when they're going to get things done. Um, you know, what, what sort of kept you going? You know, what, what is it, uh, what, what advice do you have to impart to the rest of us about how to do this really crucial but, but long game work? Um, allow your brain to work. I learned this. Uh, I learned this later when I did a couple of psychology degrees. Of actually, how the brain does. You know, no one knows exactly, but roughly what happens is is that most of it happens below the level of cognitive um, work. So I think you had to do the work in the first place. So when I was an engineer, we did quite a lot of jobs, which um, a little company, but we had a, we got a reputation for solving problems. Um, and I sort of developed a technique of working hard, working hard at addressing the problem and then just let go, just let go, go and do something else, go to sleep on it for several nights or weeks and you start to get pop-ups, um, thoughts coming to you and it's actually the, the way the brain works. So um, I, yeah, when, when I got to psychology, I thought, oh gosh, I'm right, yeah, we used to do that, you know, that's, that's actually how it works, right, okay. So um, I think with any research, or if you're trying to solve a problem, then work at, work at the research, get the, get the, a bit like, you know, when you write an essay, you get all the strands in there, you have to put it all together. But well, before you put it all together, forget it. <laughs> and allow the brain to sift it. And you get, you know, you, you, can, you can allow it to work better on its own without us interfering with their egos and thoughts and wants and desires. <laughs> well, that's great. well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're all gonna, now let our brains get to work back on our projects. Um, again, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an absolutely fantastic way to spend an hour. Uh, the uh, link to your book uh, is in the Zoom chat. Uh, we will also put it up on the website on the APS. So I encourage everybody to go out and get a copy. Uh, I know I'm gonna order mine this afternoon. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all and bye-bye. Cheerio.